So this morning I want to talk just briefly on the keys of the kingdom. And uh, all I have in here actually is just some scriptures I want to read to you. I'm sure I'll comment about them along the way. But I'm telling you that the keys of the kingdom today have been given to us. Jesus told Peter that the keys were going to be given to them. Is that right? Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. This is out of the Passion Translation. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. I'll give you just a second to look it up on your phone. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Out of the Passion. I'll start out a little bit slow and then I'll move into it. Verse 13 says, When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are the people saying about me, the Son of Man? Who do they believe I am? Is that question still being asked today of the people? Sure is. They want to know who this Jesus is. Who is he? Well, some say he's a good man. Some say he was a prophet. Some say that he was the Son of God. But Jesus is asking you, who do you say that I am? They answered, some are convinced you're, uh, you are John the baptizer. Others say you are Elijah reincarnated or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. What kind of God do we serve? He's a living God. He's alive. He's alive. Verse 17, Jesus replied, you are favored and privileged, Simeon or Simon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own, but my father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. I give you the name Peter, a stone. Petra, actually, in the Greek, it means a small stone, a pebble. And, and this rock will be the bedrock foundation on which I build my church, not on Peter, the pebble, but on the revelation that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I will build my church Upon it. My legislative assembly. What's an, a legislative assembly? A governing body. He's going to be establishing a governing body on the earth. Who do you think that governing body is? Is it, the, is it Uncle Sam? Is it Uncle Spam? <laughs> who is the governing body is it Russia is it Ukraine is it Europe surely it must be the Arab nations who is the governing body on the earth the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is that right just a quick question how good are we doing at governing? We could do better. That's correct. He said, and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. He then gave his disciples strict orders not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. You know, Jesus just had some strange things about him. You know, I've learned the more I've studied in the word of God, the more I've realized Jesus, you know, he was he was kind of weird. Yeah, the scripture calls it peculiar. We call it weird. Jesus was really different. Why wouldn't Jesus want them going out and telling everybody that he was the son of God? Because, that's right, somebody said it's not time. Because the truth is, he came 
as the Son of Man. Now, Jesus did a couple of times. He, he did tell people that he was the Son of God, told Pilate that. Is that right? But the truth is, he went about telling everybody, I'm the Son of Man. Why in the world would Jesus do that? Because he wanted to set an example. The Bible says he's the, he's the pioneer or the author and the finisher, the completer of our faith. In other words, uh, let's go back. How many of you know when Texas was founded as a state or a republic? When, when the U.S. government didn't want anything to do with Texas until Texas became prosperous and they're like, hey, 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 we need you. You know, it took some brave men. I'm going to go into a history lesson. The young people probably don't even know who I'm talking about. But there was a man named Davy what? And he did some pioneering, and there's a few others that came into this, this state. <laughs> no, I haven't, but I do know, I know my history. I'm here to tell you that he had to come in and pioneer. I, have you driven around East Texas at all, any of you? Yes. Have you looked out across those thick woods the and the lakes the and the snakes yeah. and the poison ivy yes, sir. and all that's out? Those guys were brave. Yes. Many of them brought their wives with them. Can you imagine? Wow, what they had to go through, you know, they had not only snakes and stuff, but there was actually a real live enemy out there. And they trailblazed a path into this state. Is that right? Guess who followed them? We did. Is that right? They made the way for people to come in and homestead this beautiful state. Is that right? I mean, they were pioneers. The scripture says Jesus was the pioneer of our faith. What does that mean? That means he bought pioneer knives and plates. No, no. What does it mean? It means he trailblazed the way for us. Is that right? Jesus came for a reason. It wasn't to prove that he was the Son of God. It was to prove he was God, came in a flesh and bone body so that he could trailblaze a way for you and I to follow. So when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church upon this revelation and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How many of you understand that gates don't follow you around? How many of you had a gate you pulled up to and you went to open it and, and it kind of took 12 steps away from you? <laughs> then when you drove through it, it followed you down the road. Gates are stationary, right? And he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're not supposed to be letting the gates follow us. We are going after the gate. And we're talking about keys of the kingdom this morning. And the whole key that this sets upon is this. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Do you get that? Yes, hallelujah. But Ephesians says and Romans says that when he was raised from the dead... We were raised from the dead. How many of you have been raised from the dead? Well, not yet, Pastor. Yeah, well, let me, let me tell you right now. All you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart, receive the gift, and the Bible says you've been raised from the dead. It's the resurrection power. It's interesting. He said in verse 19, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. To forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven. To release on earth that which is released in heaven. Sounds to me like this governing assembly that's supposed to be on the earth 
has a very powerful backing. You know what that backing is, right? It's not the gold standard. It's not Bitcoin. What is it? It's the kingdom of heaven. Everything that heaven has to offer. What does, what does heaven contain that we can use here on the earth? Too vague. What does heaven contain that we can use here on the earth? Peace, huh? Joy, mm -hmm. health and healing, banana pudding. <laughs> what does heaven contain that we can use here on the earth? How about God? <laughs> does heaven contain God? Could we use some God on the earth? <laughs> Woo, glory. Well, according to this scripture, Jesus' own words, if you read it in your older version or uh, if you have a new version that's a red letter edition, you'll find these words are in red letters. What does red letter mean? Jesus spoke them. He said, I will give you. Who's you? Well, it was the 12 disciples, Pastor. And you have to understand that when the last apostle died, those were keys were taken back to heaven. No, we walk in that today. When Jesus said, you hear, if, you, if you'll look it up in, the, in your Bible and you'll do some investigating, go into the Strongs and different, different uh, vine, W.E. Vines and some of those, that word you, we understand it in Texas as y'all. Does that, does that make sense to you? Y'all. I'll give unto y'all the keys of the kingdom. Is that correct? That's what this is talking about. Jesus wasn't saying, Peter, I'm going to give you the key. and James, I'll give you a key. And John, I'll give you a key. And, and, and good luck. No, he brought the keys to us. The keys of the kingdom. So I'm going to go into Romans chapter 8 right now. I'm going to read you a few keys here. That when I see keys, I see revelation knowledge. A key to operating in the power of the Almighty God in the earth is revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge, it's sad to say the New Age has taken it and twisted it and made it say, say something else. And then the religious world has picked it up and they said those who believe in revelation knowledge are of the devil. They're of the New Age. But the truth is Jesus was the one that said your heavenly Father has revealed this unto you. Revealed. Did you know reveal is the root word to revelation. And so when we're talking about revelation knowledge, we're talking about knowledge that's been revealed by the Spirit of God. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter. Jesus was telling Peter that this revelation has come to you solely by your heavenly Father. It's knowledge from heaven. And the world can't operate in it. The Bible says the world can't receive what we have. The knowledge that we have, they can't receive it. Why? Because it has to come through the Spirit, and their spirit is dead. Does that make sense to you? So here in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, this is out of the Passion. It says this, Yet God sent us His Son in human form to identify with human weakness. Let's just, settle, let's just settle this right now. He came to identify with human weakness. So if I came with all the powers of heaven, according to the scripture, Jesus was the author of all creation. He is the word of God. And the word spoke and bam, the universes were created. Is that right? So if Jesus came to identify with human weakness, but he came with all the power of heaven, how in the world could he identify with human weakness? Philippians tells us that he laid all that power aside. 
so he could actually become a human being and feel what we feel, see what we see, experience what we experience. You suppose Jesus ever experienced a day where he could have been depressed? Suppose he ever experienced a time when there was great temptation upon him and he wanted to say, God, kill them all. (laughs) Do you think he ever experienced that? The Bible says he experienced everything. Well, pastor, I'm a woman. How could he relate to me? Because he created you. You see, Jesus didn't come as God in the flesh. He came as a man. Yes, he was God. 100% God. But he was 100% man. When he got a splinter... He went, ouch. You know, some people believe Jesus was a carpenter, a carpenter's son. The scripture alludes to that in some ways, but if you do some digging, it's not necessarily the truth. But even if he was a carpenter, you suppose there was a day he could have gotten a splinter? Here's the most amazing thing, and I'm a little bit off track here, but I'm just going to go right to the rest, to the, to the crucifixion. Had not Jesus laid aside the Godhead power that he had, there would have been no way they could have killed him. I'm just here to tell you, you can't kill God. The devil's been trying for years and decades and millennia. You can't kill God. But Jesus came, laid laid aside all of his powers so he could fully experience the humanity that we have. And the truth is, it killed him. Now, yes, we understand that Jesus wasn't killed because he said, no man takes my life, but I freely lay it down. So it was a choice that he had, but still, they killed him. So why did Jesus come as a human being? Well, in the book of Hebrews, it says so he could sympathize with us, so he could become a high priest and know the very things that we go through. You see, you don't understand. Many times religion has put on us those understandings like this, uh, you know, you sinned, and because you sinned, you're evil. And because you're evil, ooh, God goes naughty, naughty, naughty. Shame, 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 shame on you. But Jesus, our high priest, has experienced everything that we've experienced. And he represents us before the Father. And he said, Father, my blood covers their sin. So when we get to the place where we're feeling hopeless and we're feeling crushed and we're feeling like the whole world is against us and sin's weighing down on us, understand this. The Bible says Jesus is praying for you. Did he not tell Peter, Peter, the enemy desires to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed that your faith has not failed. And when you are strengthened, go and strengthen your brethren. Do you understand that? That's Jesus' word to you and me. He's praying for you. I've got a question, a quick question here. You suppose God hears Jesus' prayers? Suppose he answers them? Suppose he goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, uh, not this one. Never. We don't understand this salvation that has come to us 
all because of the resurrection that happened on that one first day of the week when Mary Magdalene ran to the tomb and the angel said, he is not here, but he is risen. Whew. That just goes all over me. Thank you, Lord. He is not here. He is risen. Can you imagine? <laughs> and Mary Magdalene went running back to the disciples, those 11 men that were gathered in that place. And she went back, and oh my God, she preached the gospel. She didn't even know it was a sin for a woman to preach the gospel. <laughs> She went back and she told them, He's risen! I just saw him! And they said, Woman, uh, <clears throat> you're a woman. You don't tell us anything. We're the ones that tell you. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus appeared to them, it says, He upbraided them. You know what upbraided means? He, uh, he smacked them around a little bit. And it said he upbraided them because they didn't listen to the ones that he sent. Woo! Mm hmm. He said this. Yet God sent us his son in human form to identify with human weakness, clothed with humanity. What was he clothed with? Wow. God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. Every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled by the one who's living his life in us. Have you been burdened trying to live for Jesus? Have you found yourself where you're doing things that you don't want to do? And not doing things that you really want to do. Well. You don't need to. Jesus does it through you. Are you hearing me? Yes. He lives his life in you and me. This is up to him. Yeah, you have to get in agreement with him. But this power is working in you. This is what this scripture is talking about. Hallelujah. Some of you are getting pretty sleepy. I'm going to have to start yelling here. says, so now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live, not according to the flesh, by, by, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Woo! Romans 8, 26 and 27, very familiar passage, just right on down the line there in, in Romans. And in a similar, verse 26, and in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty, to empower us in our weakness. I just got to get stronger. You get stronger as you yield to him. You don't have to get stronger in your own flesh. That's when it becomes stinky. Remember how when, when Jesus walked to the tomb and said, remove the stone? And Mary said, Lord, he stinketh. He's been in there four days. Well, our flesh stinketh. When you try to do these things on your own, it stinks. We do it in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a whole lot more to that statement, but I don't have time to go into it. It says, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray. So, when you don't know how to pray, this is what you say. Lord, Bless their daughter and hearts. Is that what it says? What does it say? It says, or they don't know the best things to ask for. Sure we do. 
Lord, I need a new model. I mean a car. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf. Did you see that? Super intercede. Super duper superman. Super intercede. Super intercede on our behalf. Pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God, the searcher of the heart, knows full, fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. Well, hallelujah. That is our Lord and that is our Savior. My, 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 my. Verse 21 out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Say sin. sin. Say sin on our behalf. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. What was Jesus made to be? Wow. Jesus was made to be sin? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What is, what is righteousness? We're right, been made right with God. We're on right, evil, evil, even, even. We're right, even, same plane as our Lord. Is that right? Hallelujah. He himself carried our sins in his own body on the cross. This is 1 Peter 2.24. He himself carried our sins in his own body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin. Say dead. dead. You know, a few weeks back we, uh, we celebrated Brother Harmon's home going. He's walking the shores of heaven today. I'm telling you, he's doing more than walking the shores. He's downright talking to Jesus and experiencing the Apostle Paul. And who knows, he's probably teaching some up in there. Here's the truth. There wasn't some pretty little girl that came in smooching all over him and tempting him. Do you know why? He was dead. You know why? There was no life in that body. Why? Because Jesus, the, the real Harmon was in heaven. He just left that body behind. Did you know there was no temptation that came to Harmon that day? The Bible says to reckon yourselves dead with Christ. I believe that's what it says here in 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself carried our sins in his body on that cross so that we could be dead. Say dead. Dead to sin and live for righteousness. What's the big deal about being dead to sin? I mean, what's the, what's, I mean, sin is sin. I mean, there's no harm in a little, little lie here and a little lie there. Or a little cheating on your wife here and a little cheating on your wife there. Or, there's no harm. There's really no, I mean, if... There's none of that. I mean, really, it has serious consequences. Even the littlest lie. How, why, why is it so, why, I mean, God is just so picky. It reminds me of when my kids were little. And they were reaching for the cookies. And they would get their hands whacked. You know, it just seems like God's trying to take our joy away from us. Because there's all this fun stuff out there. Ooh -wee. And we reach for it. And you know, God's just a big meanie. He's out there going, no, no. That's how the world sees it. You know what? You know what? It's like when David, David, he was probably, I don't know, he was just crawling, so he's Maybe six months, something like that. How, when did he crawl? I think he walked at nine, nine months, didn't he? So he, he found a, a pair of tweezers. 
and he found an electrical socket on the floor. And he had those tweezers, and he was determined he was going to see what they did. But his mama kept saying, no, no. And pretty soon he equated that when I reach with this to go here, it hurts down here. <laughs> Mama was just being mean, keeping him from that. Here's the reason why we don't want to be in, in telling little fibs or getting involved in little things, you know, looking at certain magazines that don't flatter women. You know, it's kind of, eh, you know, as long as nobody knows. Jesus knows. The devil knows. <laughs> the reason why he doesn't want us to get involved in that is because it leaves a big, wide open gap for the devil to come in and pow! That's the whole purpose. And God doesn't want us to get involved in that. Because he knows that the devil will find a crack and pow! It's the truth. That's why we don't want to get involved in sin. Yeah, but I can't help it. Yeah, but the scripture says Jesus is praying for you. He paid the price. So you didn't have to live in that. But, but pastor, you don't understand it's so big, and I really want to. You have to change the want to. How do I change the want to? Well, hallelujah. It's for another message. I'm going to say it again. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself carried our sins in his own body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin and live for righteousness. Jesus carried your sin and my sin on that cross. It was on that cross. And God condemned it. And it went into the grave. And it went from the grave into hell itself. And God judged it there. And after three days, here's the interesting thing in Isaiah 40, God says this, comfort, comfort my people, for you have received double for your sins. You know what that means? It means Jesus received twice the amount of punishment for our sin than was necessary. Why? So that there could be no person that Satan could come up and say, this one was too evil. God covered our sin completely. Got rid of it. Paid the price so that you and I We'll never have to stand before the Father condemned. Did you hear what I said? You'll never have to stand before. If you're feeling condemned right now, if you're feeling guilty or shamed, that's not God. God paid the price for all of that. He really did. Double the pie. Price, that's exactly right. Double the pie. 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 <laughs> It said, our instant healing flowed from his wounding. What kind of healing did we get? Mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, last scripture, says this. For you have experienced the extravagant grace. What is extravagant grace? When you, when you hear somebody saying, wow, they're really dressed extravagantly, what do you think of? Somebody in ripped shorts? They're dressed extravagantly. I heard there was a big government powwow party for fundraisers this past weekend. And uh, they said, with all the ones that were at that, 
there was $42 trillion worth of wealth in that room. Represented. 42, how much? Trillion. Dollars in that room. You suppose they came dressed in ripped shorts? Silk suits, yeah. Probably $10,000 suits or more. <laughs> yeah, plenty of pride. Came in, you know, they didn't even have to drive. They had someone do the driving for them, didn't they? They didn't even have to get on the commercial airline, did they? How'd they get there? They walked because they were really protecting global warming. How did they get there? They flew their private jet. Yeah, and here's the interesting thing. Just one of those puts out more carbon dioxide, a bigger footprint, than a hundred cars driving for a year. And that was just one trip. Woo! Hallelujah. What? They stepped out on a red carpet. Whoa. Well, according to this, it says you've experienced the extravagant grace. What does extravagant grace look like? Have you ever seen somebody come in with just a woman, specifically I'm talking about, not, not a man, but come in with, you know, loaded pearls around their neck and glittering diamonds and gold? We would call that extravagant. Well, what does extravagant grace look like? Wow. Just think about that. Mm. We have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That although he was infinitely rich. How rich was he? What does that mean? We were talking about 42 trillion. Well, infinitely is greater than that, don't you think? He was infinitely rich. He impoverished himself for our sake so that by his poverty we become rich beyond measure. Yes, Pastor, we have been made spiritually rich. Well, that's true. But if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul was talking about money. He was talking about giving. And he was reminding them, look, this is who you really are. You've experienced extravagant grace. He experienced your poverty so that by his poverty, we could experience his extravagance do you see the whole point of this is to point out well pastor I wish that was true because I could sure pay from I need my light bill paid it just Jesus gave us the keys to the kingdom he didn't give them to the devil right now I mean, I'm here to tell you you may not understand this but the devil has our money I'm not getting ready to receive an offering, so don't panic. <laughs> I, want, I want you to understand, God has blessed you so abundantly. Absolutely. He needs you to walk in it. Yes. The honest to God truth, I don't need two or three or four or five or six houses. I don't need 10 or 12 cars. I don't need 15 private jets. But what I do need is enough money to help others. Amen. I love giving. Do you know that? How about you? There's, there's nothing more rewarding when you give somebody something and they can't even do anything back for you. Just to bless them just to see a smile on their face, just to see a little bit of hope 
come back into their face. There's nothing like seeing that. God has given us enough to be able to do that anywhere. If you'll read just over in the next chapter, he said that we may have enough to meet every need. Well, pastor, why don't you preach that more? Because this is not a wealth gospel. Do you know there's no such thing as a wealth and health gospel? It's just called the gospel. It belongs to us. Salvation. There's been a lot of emphasis on that. I'm just going to tell you that's not good. It's not safe for the body of Christ. But here's what we do know. God, who knew no sin, sent his son to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We can walk in every victory that Jesus purchased for us. That's what we really celebrate on this Resurrection Sunday. We are so thankful for Jesus. We are so thankful for the sacrifice on the cross. We are so thankful that he took those beatings upon his body. That pieces of flesh were ripped out when they used that whip. We are so thankful that when they took that big reed and they beat him in the head with those big long thorns that went in and blood poured out of his body. We are so thankful that he did that. He hung on that cross. He died. Basically he asphyxiated on on that cross and then he went into hell and he paid the greatest of price for us but we are not celebrating today that alone we are celebrating what Jesus accomplished for us he has set us free from the hand of the enemy. The body of Christ needs to get this today. He has given us the keys. We are the general assembly of the great and almighty God, representatives of the king right here on this earth. We are the ones that are supposed to rule and reign in this life on the earth. Jesus Christ is the king, and he has made us his sons. I will tell tell you this in history when you study about the kings and the great queens their kids were exempt from a lot of stuff well we are sons and daughters of the great I am and I'm just telling you we are exempt from a lot pastor that just sounds like you're spoiled yeah I'm spoiled. I heard someone say this. I don't, I don't remember who, who posted I saw it on Facebook. Said, favor is not fair. You know what that means? That means when God touches you and someone else don't get that touch, they may think it's unfair but it's because you're a son and a daughter of the king. Is that right? The world looks at, at Christianity right now and they mock it. Do you know why? Because we're living so far below our privilege. We're supposed to be ruling and reigning. I'm not saying we're supposed to be up in Washington, D.C. or in the governments. That's not what I'm saying at all. You, this is how I learned how I reign my life and my family and my home. You reign your home? Yeah, in the spirit. You know how I do it? On my knees. I rule and reign in the spirit. And when you rule and reign in the spirit, it just pours out into the natural. Resurrection Sunday. That's what today is. It's not that Jesus was raised from the dead. It was that Jesus and the whole world was raised from the dead. And the only thing that's remaining is for us to say, Father, I receive it. That's it. That's what Romans, that's what we just read. We were raised together with him. Consider yourself dead to sin. That's what it says. Romans, we just read it. Consider yourself dead. D-E-E-D-E. -E -D -E, dead. 
That's how the devil spells. Well, anyway, stand to our feet.